we've heard over the years many stories from uh, many people, survivors of the Holocaust, who've kindly spent their time sharing with us the stories that I believe are so important. We must hear them as often and as many times as we can. Today and this morning, we're joined by Yuri Winterstein. And I'm so grateful, Yuri, for you joining us today. Thank you very much. Yuri lives just down the road in Chiswick um, and has very, very kindly um, agreed to come and share his story um, with us today. And I'm really grateful to you for doing that. Thank you very much. For all the guests joining us this morning, again, thank you. Just to let you know that we will be recording this. It will be available on YouTube. Um, I just want you to be aware of that. But I believe, as I've said, it's important that we capture the stories, as many of them as we can. Um, and, and the next, the next uh, thing I was going to say was, if I could ask all of you kindly to mute, all the guests to mute, um, just because otherwise we get quite a lot of feedback and we want to hear Yuri's story. Um, but thank everybody for taking the time. It is so important um, that you've joined us today. And I'd like to hand over to you now to Yuri Winterstein, who will tell us his story. Some of it of great hope, but some of it clearly of great sorrow. Yuri, thank you again. And I'll hand to you um, to share with us your experience. Thank you. We'll have some Q&As after, um, so questions we can hold on to, but Yuri, over to you, and thank you very much for joining us. Well, thank you as well. I want to thank Hammersmith and Fulham Council for inviting me here today, because uh, it is a privilege to be able to talk to you. Uh, I'm here, as been said, to tell you about my families and my experiences during uh, World War II. I am a survivor of the genocide commonly referred to as a Holocaust, although, uh, sorry, I just didn't get, uh, although I, I do have to point out that I was born during the war. I was only a toddler age at the end of the war. So you will understand that I don't actually have any direct memories of those times myself. But the fact remains, as melodramatic as it may sound, that I was born under a death sentence because by the time I was born, the Nazis had made the fateful decision of what they came to call the final solution of the Jewish problem, which effectively meant the extermination of all Jews in Nazi-held territory. And babies and infants, of course, were a particular high-risk group anyway, because not only weren't they uh, useful as slave labor, and uh, the Germans wanted to use able-bodied people, not just Jews, but others as well as slave labor. Uh, uh, but even worse, babies, of course, required the attention of adults. So it's a high-risk group. So in that sense, I, I am a survivor. Although all I can tell you are stories that were handed down to me by family and things that I have uh, learned through reading and, and research. Now you might wonder why I wanna talk about such terrible times and particularly now that they're so long ago. And the fact is that I'm really trying to speak about the future. Uh, but if we don't learn from the past, as we know, we will repeat the, the mistakes of the past. And what I'm talking about is to tell you what happens to a society if the society allows its prejudices to harden into hatred and extreme ideologies to flourish. Then we end up in a genocide or some other equally horrible event. Um, now, it can happen in any society. The Germany, after all, was a very advanced society. It had produced world-renowned scientists and philosophers and writers and musicians, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But none of that was enough to prevent the rise of the Nazis with a very extreme ideology. At the heart of that ideology was a belief that you could categorize people 
uh, primarily by blood, by race, although there were other categories as well. And that some groups of people were so, uh, in their view, degenerate that they felt it was permissible uh, to kill them. Now, the Jews were the number one pet hate group of the Nazis, but by no means the only one. Uh, they killed many Roma or Gypsy people, uh, homosexuals, Jehovah Witnesses, Blacks, were other peoples on their list, there were many. Uh, and in fact, the killing spree of the Nazis started at home with seriously disabled people although they had to give that program up when there was uh, a large outcry in the public when they learned about what was uh, going on. Now, the Nazis knew that their ideas were not very widely shared in the world. And so they always did their best to hide their game. They didn't speak openly. They spoke in euphemisms. So they talked about resettlement of people, or as I say, the words, uh, the, the uh, final solution, but what they weren't saying is killing. Um, but we now know uh, what, what uh, such extreme ideology uh, can lead to. <coughs> Sorry. Now, in order to tell you my story, I want to give you uh, a bit of background on my family. First of all, uh, where we come from, who we were, uh, and then also a little bit of background about the political events that resulted in our being caught up in the nightmare uh, of the Holocaust. So uh, if I could have the first slide just briefly. Um, okay. Uh, sorry, the next slide after this one. Uh, my family uh, and I come from Central Europe. We come from a country uh, in, in this map in 1933, Czechoslovakia, which is where I was born. Okay, I think we can move on from the slide. Um, my father was born in a small, mm. sorry, no, uh, if we can just ditch the slides at the moment. My, <coughs> my father was born in a small village of Banovce in Slovakia in 1903. He was born into a, a relatively poor family. My grandfather was a clerk in a law office. Uh, he and his wife had five children, three boys and two girls. And they aspired to their sons going to university, something no one in the family had done before. Now, my father was the eldest of the boys. He went to the local primary school in the village, but if you wanted to go to university, you had to go to a secondary school known as a gymnasium. And in order to get into a gymnasium, you had to have some knowledge of Latin. So who better to tutor my father in Latin than the local Catholic priest of uh, Banovse, Father Joseph Tiso. I mention this seemingly irrelevant little story because Joseph Tiso came to play a very prominent uh, part in the history of Slovakia, both before and during the war, and I will come back to him. But my father did go on to university and he studied law and went on to have a successful uh, law practice, his own law practice afterwards. But his real passion was his concern for the Jewish community there was a lot of anti-Semitism in Slovakia, as unfortunately there was throughout most of Europe. And my father was heavily involved in Jewish organizations from an early age onwards, already at university. He was taking uh, leadership roles sometimes in organizations, and that remained the case throughout his life. Uh, now, let me park my father's story a moment and talk about my mother. My mother was born in the city of Moravska Ostrava in what is now the Czech Republic. Uh, she was born into a, a well-off family. Uh, my grandparents had three children, two uh, girls and a boy. And they uh, 
uh, wanted their children to go to university. <coughs> so my mother uh, went to the University of Prague and also studied law. In fact, she was in the first wave of women there uh, to study law, to become lawyers. Uh, and although wave might be a bit strong because there were only two of them. Uh, but if I tell you my, my mother uh, was a very strong, feisty woman, you will understand when I say that I, I grew up in a feminist household long before I ever learned the term feminist. Uh, now, shortly after my mother graduated, through some mutual acquaintance, my parents were introduced uh, and the rest, as they say, is history. Uh, they got married in 1932. My sister Ruth was born in 1937. I didn't follow until 1943, but that puts us in the middle of the war. So let me step back and talk about the events that resulted in our being caught up in this whole affair. Now Hitler, when he came to power in Germany in January, 1933, his first priority really was to strengthen his own position. Uh, and it didn't take very long for him to become uh, a dictator. He was uh, democratically elected, but eventually uh, became a dictator known as Der Fuhrer. <coughs> And his other priority was to build up his armed forces. But from the very outset of the uh, he set out a vision of an enlarged Germany, which would incorporate in it all the surrounding lands where there were significant numbers of uh, Germans living or German speakers. So in 19, early 1937, he felt strong enough to begin on his foreign adventures. And not surprisingly, his first target was Austria, not only a fellow German speaking country, but actually the country of his birth. And in fact, uh, a number of senior Nazis came from Austria as well. And he managed a, a relatively peaceful takeover known as the Anschluss of uh, Austria in early uh, 1938. Uh, and he then promptly turned to his second target, which was now Czechoslovakia, or more specifically, an area in Czechoslovakia known as the Sudetenland. And if I can have the next slide, uh, we will show uh, Sudetenland. Um, so the slide after this one, yes. So the areas marked in red uh, were Sudetenland, where there were significant numbers of Germans living. And uh, okay, we, we, I think we can move that on. Uh, and Hitler demanded of the Czech Republic, Czechoslovakian Republic uh, government that they cede the Sudetenland to Germany. Now, not surprisingly, the, the Czech government was not eager to surrender either part of its territory or of its citizens to a, another power. But being much smaller and weaker than Germany, they looked to their allies and principally the British and the French to support them against Hitler's demands. But as we know from our history books uh, in the uh, Munich uh, meeting in September, 1938, uh, the then prime minister of this country, Sir Neville Chamberlain, agreed to Hitler's demands and the French government did so as well. And so uh, the Czech government, now finding itself without allies, uh, reluctantly ceded Sudetenland to Germany and German uh, army troops were able to march into that area without any opposition. Now, Sir Neville Chamberlain, when he returned to this country, waved the agreement in the air and said, peace in our times. But of course, it only showed how little he understood Hitler and Hitler's intentions. But it didn't take long for Hitler's intentions to become clearer because in March, 1939, Hitler made 
two almost simultaneous moves against the rest of Czechoslovakia. On the one hand, he ordered an invasion of the rest of what is today the Czech Republic, uh, Bohemia, Moravia, uh, on some feeble pretext. And the Czech army was so demoralized, not only by the, what had happened in Munich and the lack of its allies, but now also by the fact that the main Czech military defensive positions against Germany were in the hills and mountains of Sudetenland, and these were now in the hands of the German army. So there was no opposition from the army at all. It was a peaceful uh, takeover of that part of the country. But for Slovakia, Hitler had a different plan. And he invited the head of uh, a party, a local party in Slovakia, the People's uh, Slovak People's Party, uh, to uh, come to Germany and to uh, uh, declare uh, Slovakia independent. The head of uh, uh, the Slovak People's Party at this stage was Joseph Tiso, who I mentioned earlier. Uh, and in fact, I'm terribly sorry, uh, and I will just take a step back to mention another incident with Tiso in the mid 1930s and with the Slovak People's Party. Because in the national elections in the mid 30s, uh, my father, who was not politically particularly active, became very active in the national elections, campaigning against the Slovak People's Party because they were echoing the anti-Semitic language of the Nazis. And as I, at that point, Joseph Tiso wasn't the head of the party, he was, but he was a leading officer already in that party. And so my father's and his path crossed for a second time. And it seems from a story I will tell you later that Tiso did not forget uh, this opposition. Now Hitler invited Tiso uh, to Berlin uh, as I say, to declare Slovakia independent. And effectively, uh, two new countries were born. They were known generally, however, as the protectorates of Bohemia and Moravia and the protectorate of Slovakia. Protectorates because in theory, they were under the protection of Germany. Although the reality was that the Germans were calling the tombs. Now to show you how important the anti-Semitism was to the Slovak People's Party. Uh, this was mid-March when uh, Tiso went to Berlin. He had to return to Bratislava, the capital of Slovakia. He had to set up a new government. And already in April 1939, that government started to pass the first of a series of anti-Jewish legislation. Uh, and this legislation echoed very much the kind of uh, laws that had been passed in Germany earlier in the 1930s. So Jews were excluded, for example, from a number of professions, including being teachers in public schools or lecturers in universities. Uh, Jewish businesses were not allowed to have Aryans, uh, non-Jews, uh, working for them. Uh, but there were also a number of much pettier types of uh, uh, legislation or laws. Uh, Jews were not allowed to have radios, uh, to have sports equipment. They had to turn all of these things into the government. Uh, they couldn't go into to, to cinema or uh, theaters. Uh, they couldn't uh, go into the state parks. Um, and there were a lot of other, uh, other such uh, uh, laws. And of course, how were people going to know who was a Jew? Because the Jews were not living in the ghetto, they were living scattered amongst the rest of the population. And so uh, all Jews were required to uh, wear this yellow star of David with a German Jude on it. Uh, all Jews over the age of six had to wear uh, this uh, when they left their homes. Uh, now, terrible as these laws were, as we know, uh, worse was to come. And in March 1942, 
the Germans announced that they were shortly going to begin the deportation of the Jews of Slovakia. Now, one might wonder whether the Slovak government was inquiring of the Germans what it is they were doing with their citizens. These were their citizens being taken out of the country by a foreign power. But to the shame of the Slovak government of the day, not only didn't they really pursue that question, they were the only government under the control of the Nazis and at the height of the Nazi empire, they controlled many governments in Europe that entered into a formal agreement with the Germans about the deportation of the Jews. And under that agreement, uh, Slovakia agreed to pay 500 Reichsmarks for every Jew who was deported, which was a considerable sum. Uh, I saw a recent figure saying this would be the equivalent of over 2,000 US dollars per person. But uh, the, the Slovak government, of course, was not really out of pocket because they were able to keep all the property that the Jews had to leave behind. Uh, at deportation, people were allowed to take a suitcase with them. So they had to leave most of their belongings and most importantly, their homes. These became property of the state and were, uh, could be redistributed to other people. There was also a clause in the government, uh, in, the, in the agreement under which those Jews who were deported should not return to Slovakia. Now, a, a final bit of background before I talk about my family uh, is concentration camps about which we've all heard. Now, the Nazis started to build concentration camps as soon as they came into power uh, in 1933. So the first camps they built, like Dachau, were in Germany. Uh, these were not death camps, although many people died in them. Uh, they were camps to house their political enemies and undesirable people like the Jews and other groups. But once the war started, they began to build different types of camps as well outside of Germany. Uh, one group of such camps were what I call slave labor camps, because as I say, they used able-bodied people as slave labor. And if they didn't die uh, doing that work, they were eventually shipped to other camps. They built, of course, the infamous death camps of which Auschwitz uh, is the best known because it's the largest. Uh, I tried to research how many people uh, died there uh, I couldn't find a, a, a one figure. There's a range of figures, but it's somewhere between 1.1 million and 1.5 million. And although the Jews were by far the largest number of those, roughly 100,000 non-Jews perished in Auschwitz as well, hardly an inconsequential number. And they also built camps that were what it actually says, a concentration camp, a place to keep people together till they decided what to do with them. And one such camp was built in a town in Czechoslovakia known as Theresien or Theresienstadt. So if I could have this next slide, I will show you Theresienstadt on the map. Sorry, there's a slide before this. Uh, oh, sorry, this, this slide, yeah. You can see Theresien here on the map. It's very near the border of Germany and uh, Poland. But the reason, uh, one of the, 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 the site of it is very important for them, but another reason was its nature. Uh, Theresienstadt was built in the late 18th century as a military fortress town. Uh, and as such, it had a wall all around it. So the Germans moved the five to 6,000 people living in Theresienstadt out and moved the Jews in. And I have the next two slides, if they could be shown, will give you an idea of what Theresienstadt looked like. You can see these are proper solid 
uh, town. It's not wooden barracks as you might think in a typical concentration camp. This was a proper town. The next slide also gives you a, a, a better idea of this town. This was a proper town. Uh, and it, because of its nature, it also lent itself uh, to a special role for the Germans, which I'll come to a bit later. Okay, if we could take the slide down. Um, so having uh, given you all this background, what about my family? And let me start by getting the worst uh, out up front uh, that of my close family, which I would consider a direct line of descent uh, and uncles, aunts, and cousins, a total of nine members of my family uh, perished in the Holocaust. All of them uh, died in Auschwitz. The, the eldest was my great grandmother, uh, my father's grandmother, who was 91 years old when she was deported. My father's two sisters and their husbands were also deported. They each had a daughter. Now my cousin Judith was 15 years old when she was picked up by German soldiers on the street. And they obviously thought she was old enough to be treated like an adult because she was taken to the train station and deported on her own. And when her parents learned what had happened to her, they were so distraught, they volunteered to go on the next train. Now this was 1942. And you have to understand that uh, nobody knew yet of death camps. Uh, and we have a long history of persecution and therefore, you could say a certain folk wisdom that comes down with it that says if you can only keep your head about you and not be in the wrong place at the wrong time, you will survive to see better times again. Now, I'm sure my uncle and aunt didn't think they were volunteering to go on a picnic, that wherever they were being sent was going to be very harsh conditions. But they didn't know that the end of the tracks was a place called Auschwitz. Uh, my other cousin Miriam was nine years old when she was deported with her parents and one of her grandmothers, my father's mother, so my grandmother as well. And uh, they're the only members of the family about which we had eyewitness accounts after the war as to what happened to them. And we were told that they were taken straight from the trains to the gas stations, uh, to the gas chambers. But I don't know how the other members of my family uh, died there, other than the fact that they never came out of Auschwitz. And the last member of my family who died there was my mother's mother, so my other grandmother as well. But other members of my family survived. So how did they survive? Well, some of them, by getting out of Czechoslovakia while that was still possible. My mother's brother and sister both left in time. One of my father's brothers uh, emigrated to then Palestine to Tel Aviv uh, with his wife. My father's youngest brother and his wife uh, got false identification papers because all adults in, in Czechoslovakia had to have ID papers. And those papers seem to have been uh, well enough forged that they were able to survive the six long years of this nightmare uh, under those papers and with an assumed new name uh, and living in another uh, city than uh, where they were from. And uh, my mother, uh, father and sister, and myself, I can only ascribe our survival uh, to pure luck, as I will tell. Now, one of the things I unfortunately am not able to tell you uh, really anything about is what was daily life like during this period, because my family did not talk about their experiences in the war when I was growing up. Uh, only my mother, when she felt I was old enough 
uh, to start telling me the stories of the family. Uh, she, she told me those sort of stories, but she didn't uh, go into any other uh, detail. <coughs> but it doesn't take a lot of imagination to realize that they and the whole Jewish community would have been living in daily fear of what was coming. Uh, that would have been survival, would have been the chief preoccupation. I know that my parents always had a plan in their back pockets to go into hiding if the, if the danger was imminent. I know for my sister, she, when she became five, uh, was unable to go, of course, to the local school. Uh, and of course, she couldn't go to the parks either. Uh, but I don't know really anything else about those times. Now, an issue that's come up uh, many times over the years is, didn't the Jews uh, resist? Or why didn't they resist as often the way it's put? And by which I've always understood armed resistance. So let me explain a little bit about resistance. Uh, if we take Slovakia, first of all, in terms of armed resistance, this was a total non-starter. It was a civilian population. They didn't have weapons. They were living scattered, as I say, amongst the rest of the population. They were living with their children, with their elderly relatives. They didn't have a friendly border to at least try to escape from or the sea. Armed resistance was, was really impossibility. There were cases of armed resistance. Uh, the best known is the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, but these were special circumstances. And people were living, as I say, in hope. Uh, as I say, that this is a normal default for people that uh, while there's life, there's hope. People think if I can only get through this, things will eventually resume to normality. Uh, but there are other forms of resistance. I would suggest to you that the fact that the Jewish community did its best to try to uh, continue to educate their children was a form of resistance. The Germans were saying, there is no future uh, for you Jews. And what is education about but the future? And in Slovakia specifically, there was a small underground informal movement of nine Jews who tried any idea that they thought might help not only the community in Slovakia, but wider as well, uh, short of armed resistance. Uh, they became known in literature as the working group or the Bratislava working group. Uh, they had no formal structure, but effectively they were led by two people, uh, Rabbi Dov Weismandel and a woman, woman Gizzy Fleischman. And I have a photograph of Gizzy Fleischman I'd like to put up uh, because to me, she is one of the unsung heroines of the war. So could I have uh, uh, that slide, please? It'll be the next uh, slide. So Gizzy Sle uh, Fleischmann had opportunities to leave Slovakia and go join her two daughters who were living in Tel Aviv. But she felt that her duty was to stay with her community in its time of trouble. Uh, and I would like to just read to you one short section of a letter she wrote uh, to one of her daughters in 1943. Fate has willed us apart. Yet the same fate has also willed that during the years of our people's greatest misery, your mother is fulfilling a great mission in order to ease this terrible suffering. If I survive this difficult period, I think I will be able to say that I have not lived in vain. In this spirit, you must bear this separation. The suffering of the people of Israel stands above any personal pain. But it pains me always to have to say that in 1944, Gizzi Fleischmann was picked up by the Gestapo, sent to Auschwitz with specific orders to be liquidated on arrival. But I do feel that she did not live in vain. The work that she and the working group did 
uh, saved many lives. I, I think we can take the slide down now. Now, my father was one of the seven other members of the working group. Uh, so what did the working group do? Uh, I'll just talk about some of the more important, uh, a couple of the more important things that they managed to do. Uh, the, the most important, I think, was actually stopping the deportation of the Jews of Slovakia for almost two years, from October uh, 1942 to late September 1944. So how was this achieved? It was done by bribing the key Slovak and most importantly, German uh, people involved. SS officer Dieter Wislicheni, who was nominally an advisor to the Slovak government on Jewish affairs, but actually the man, of course, uh, calling the tune, uh, was one of the people who was bribed. <coughs> now, having successfully done, stopped the deportations, the, the, the thought then came, maybe this could be extended throughout Nazi-held territory. And a plan to this effect was proposed uh, to Dieter Wislicheni, uh, which became known as the Europa Plan in, 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 the, in books. Uh, and Dieter Wislicheni, at least in theory, uh, went to Berlin and discussed it and came back and said Berlin was interested in discussing the plan further, but demanded a large down payment. And the working group tried desperately to raise the amount that was being asked for. I know Gizzi Fleischmann actually traveled to Hungary where there was a much larger Jewish community at that point in time, not in danger yet, although subsequently virtually liquidated, but they uh, were unable to raise the amount and the plan was still born. Now, I tried to research what actually happened. I'm not even sure Dieter Wislicheni necessarily discussed it in Berlin. He may just have been trying to shake down some more money for himself. I don't know. But another thing that the uh, uh, working group did was to give the world evidence of the existence of Auschwitz. Because in early 1944, Two young Slovak uh, Jews escaped from Auschwitz. They made their way to Bratislava where they contacted someone on the working group. They were then asked to draw up as detailed a plan as they could of Auschwitz, including the layout. And this plan was smuggled uh, to Switzerland from where it was distributed to the international press. There had been rumors in the world about such things, but this was now clear evidence of the existence of uh, death camps in Nazi held uh, territory. Uh, now, uh, a, a specific story uh, to do with my father. Uh, I want to read just that uh, a little bit out of a book, uh, it's called To Deliver Their Souls. Uh, it's based on the diaries of a uh, Rabbi Frieder. Uh, Rabbi Frieder was in the working group and kept this diary. And uh, many, many years after the war, uh, Rabbi Frieder actually died right at the end of the war. Uh, his brother uh, produced this book. Now, I find it interesting uh, there are a couple of ministers uh, mentioned in this uh, particular episode, uh, Joseph Sivak, uh, and uh, uh, I'll come across the name of the other one in a minute. Uh, but what interested me was that in this highly anti-Semitic government during the war, there was a minister, Joseph Sivak, who was friendly uh, to the Jews and did his best to help the Jewish community clearly at a, a great risk uh, to himself. Um, so on May 12th, orders were issued to arrest Dr. Winterstein and to transfer him and his family to a camp. We had neither rest nor repose until the darkness cleared somewhat. Joseph Sivak 
help me solve the riddle of the warrant for Dr. Winterstein's arrest. The latter was born in Barnafsi, where President Tiso had his parish, and Tiso wished the Minister of Interior to explain to him how it was that this clever Jew was still living freely on the soil of Slovakia. Sanomach, the Minister of Interior, immediately issued orders to put Winterstein and his entire family in a camp. Now, my father was tipped off by Sivak and went into hiding. Uh, and the story is resumed in, in the diaries uh, a bit later on. Uh, I devoted the first work days of July to canceling the arrest warrant against Winterstein, who has been in hiding for two months. This was an extremely difficult undertaking since the warrant for his arrest had been issued by the president himself and only a person of ministerial rank could cancel this order. Sivak tried to do so a number of times, but without success. On July 3rd, I appealed to him again. This time I requested that he appeal directly to Tiso since the person who issued the arrest warrant should be the person to rescind it. Sivak did so. The president did not promise to take specific action to help Winterstein but indicated he would not take any measures against him or oppose his release. Thus, there was room for hope. And in fact, a couple of days later, uh, the order was rescinded and my father uh, was able to come out of hiding. Now, I told you that the deportations were halted for almost two years, but why did they start again? Well, in August, 1944, there was a popular rebellion against the Slovak government. And it took the German army to quell that rebellion. And the Germans now decided to take direct control of day-to-day -day running of the government. Tiso remained as a figurehead president, but the Germans were now running uh, the government. Also very importantly, Adolf Eichmann, who you may have heard of, had moved Alois Brumer, uh, sorry, had moved uh, Dieter Wisliceni from Slovakia to another country and sent in his place SS officer Alois Brumer to Slovakia. And Alois Brumer, on arrival uh, in September 1944 uh, in Bratislava, announced that his first and top priority was ridding Slovakia of all remaining Jews. And one of his first decrees was that all remaining Jews in Bratislava should be housed in certain selected apartment buildings, not only easier to keep an eye on, but much more importantly, easier to have ready for transportation when a train was available. Because by this time, the war was going badly for the Germans and they didn't know when a train was going to be available. So they had to be ready to move quickly. Now my parents and my sister were moved into a room in one of these apartments. And as I've said, they had a, always a plan to go into hiding ready. And that evening they discussed uh, going into hiding the next day, they would put their plan into action. But as luck would have it, that very night, a train came to uh, Bratislava ready for deportation. So at dawn, the building was surrounded by German soldiers. Soldiers came into all the rooms and ordered everyone out. Now my mother pleaded with a soldier that came into the room where, the, where they were to leave uh, my sister behind. My sister was seven years old and my parents thought she had a better chance of survival if left behind than if she went with them to a camp. To my surprise, when my mother told me the story, this soldier didn't just tell her to shut up and get on with it. He just said, well, I have to ask my superior officer. And the superior officer surprised me even more because he not only agreed to my mother's request, but he said, who will look after the girl? So we will leave the mother as well. So on that day, my father uh, was deported, but my mother and sister were allowed to go. Uh, as the soldiers left, one of them turned and said, we will catch you later. 
Nevertheless, uh, my sister believes that, and so did my parents, that uh, this humanitarian uh, gesture of the, the officer saved my sister's life, that she would not have survived had she gone to camp with my father. Now that same day, my mother and sister were on a tram going to the hiding place. They were traveling with a, a good friend of my father's, uh, Dr. Ernst Abelis, who was also on the working group. And my mother became nervous uh, about a German soldier on the tram who was staring at them. So she said, let's just get off the next station to be uh, rid of him. But when they got off, the soldier got off as well. And now he came up to them and demanded to see their ID papers. And while Abeles was fumbling in his pockets to uh, find his papers, my mother grabbed my sister's hand and she said, run. And they ran as quickly as they could. Now, my sister, who only told me this story uh, about three years ago, said that she was afraid the soldier was going to shoot at them. He had a rifle, so she, she looked behind, but he was just looking bemused at them. And he clearly thought it was a family unit because in another humanitarian gesture, he turned to Abelis and said, you better go join your wife and daughter. Although he also added those words, we'll catch you later. Nevertheless, another humanitarian uh, gesture there. And so on that day, my mother and sister had two very narrow escapes, but were able to go into hiding uh, with Abelis and with a number of other Jews in a bunker underground. So how lucky can you get, except that their luck did eventually run out because a young woman who was in hiding with them wrote a letter to a boyfriend, which was intercepted by the Gestapo and uh, had enough information uh, for them to find the hiding place. Uh, and this time uh, there was no lucky escape. Now this was, uh, as far as I can best establish, because I never was given dates, would have been very late November or December already. Uh, my mother told me she found herself in an awkward position because when my father had been in hiding, he had written her a number of letters with instructions though that she should destroy the letters after reading them because they contained incriminating material about the working group. But my mother out of sentimentality, uh, afraid she might not see her husband again, had kept those letters. And now she was afraid that they would fall into the hands of the Germans. So she told me she put the letters under her sweater. She made her way to a stove in the middle of the room, uh, which was there for heating. And before the guards realized what she was doing, she opened the grate and threw the letters in. I believe she got a, a little bit of a beating, but the letters were destroyed. Now, my mother and sister had the great luck uh, when they were deported of uh, meeting my father. And uh, they were all together in Theresienstadt. Now, Theresienstadt, as I said, was not a death camp. Although almost a quarter of the Jews who were sent there died there. They died mainly of uh, hunger, uh, malnutrition, and or disease. Uh, and of course, diseases spread very quickly through uh, a highly overcrowded uh, environment with people very weak from hunger. Uh, and some people were killed by being shot or whatever by the Germans as well, but it wasn't per se a death camp. Uh, now, it, I have some stories that came down to me from the family there. On one occasion, my father was taken to the train station with orders to be sent to Auschwitz. As luck would have it, the secretary of the German commandant of the train station was slave labor, a Jewish woman. She recognized my father and she pleaded with the commandant not to put him on the train. She said he was her fiance. And in another humanitarian act, 
the commandant sent my father back to Theresienstadt. On another occasion, my parents were told there was going to be a special train to take all Jewish leadership in the camp and their families to Switzerland. My mother, when she told me the story, said they were concerned about this story because it seemed highly unlikely. <clears throat> and in fact, there was no such train. But uh, as I told you, uh, Theresienstadt played a special role for the Germans uh, during the war because of its special nature. It lent itself to a game of make-believe for them. Uh, they knew that the world was he healing, hearing a lot of rumors about the treatment of the Jews. So they invited a Swiss Red Cross uh, committee to come and visit Theresienstadt. For purposes of the visit, first of all, they deported as many people from there as they could, so it wasn't as heavily overcrowded. Theresienstadt at its height had nearly 60,000 people in a place where five to 6,000 people were living before. <coughs> so seriously overcrowded. But they also wanted to make it look like a normal life was going on. They opened the bank and actually printed some special Theresienstadt money as if that was going on. Uh, they opened a bakery. Uh, they had a candy store in the square in the center of the town handing out sweets to the children. And the only thing that my sister had ever told me about her experiences until a few years ago was that she told me she saw a most magical puppet show for the children. This was all part of an effort to fool uh, the Red Cross uh, committee visiting Theresienstadt and it worked. But there's a silver lining in that story because uh, for me, because when uh, they were there, they were asked uh, what uh, they knew about this train that was going to take the Jewish leadership. And they replied that they had no knowledge of such a train. And I assume also that they took the matter up with the commandant of Auschwitz because it was never mentioned again after that visit. Now, some stories from there of a, of a different nature. My mother told me that uh, on one uh, occasion, volunteers were asked to go uh, pick uh, potatoes in the fields. Now the fields, it was still very cold. The fields were, it was hard physical work. My mother was not uh, from the farms. She was a city woman uh, used to working behind a desk. And nevertheless, she instantly volunteered and got a good friend to volunteer as well. And she told me she did so because she thought perhaps there would be a chance to smuggle a potato or two for the family. And under the conditions I've explained to you uh, in Theresienstadt, you may understand that at that point in time, uh, a, a potato would be worth more than its weight in gold for, for the people who were very hungry there. And my mother did, at obviously great risk to herself, manage to smuggle some potatoes doing this. And a final story from Theresienstadt before I talk about myself. Uh, my sister told me she was in the streets when she saw a German uniform and she knew uh, German uniform meant danger and she was absolutely petrified. She told me she stared at her feet as, as kids do, if I don't see you, you don't see me. She wanted to sink into the ground, she said. But of course he could see her and he came up to her and he patted her on the head and he said, little girl, don't be frightened. I have a little daughter just like you. And it was a pure act, humanitarian act. He, he walked off with nothing else. So what about me? Well, I was born in October 1943 in Bratislava. And having mentioned Bratislava before as a capital of Slovakia, maybe I can just show you a picture of what it was like in those days. So can I have the next slide, please? So this is Bratislava with a 
castle uh, in the center and the Danube just behind it. Uh, okay, th thank you for that. Uh, now, I was a very difficult birth. I was born at home, of course. Uh, I was a very difficult birth. Uh, my mother lost a lot of blood and the doctor, a Jewish doctor, of course, who, who came to the house, told my father uh, that uh, she'd lost too much blood, she would not survive. Uh, there was no question of blood, tr blood transfusions. Uh, now, my mother and I have different stories as to how she survived. My mother, when she told me the story, said she survived by eating any scrap of liver that she could find and building up her, her blood supply. That was her, that's how she thought she managed that. And as a, a child, I accepted that story. But as an adult, when I reflected on it, I thought it didn't really add up. Uh, and my own conclusion was that she survived on sheer willpower. She was, as I say, a very strong-willed woman. But whatever the case was, she did survive. When I was one month old, my parents gave me away to an Aryan family. <coughs> Sorry. They did so because they were aware that they might need to go into hiding at a short notice at any time. And that it was very difficult to hide with a child. My mother told me it was difficult to explain to my sister why she had to be quiet when a German army search was near uh, the hiding place, but absolutely impossible, of course, with a baby. And in fact, in my researches, I came across a couple of cases of infants who were accidentally smothered to death by people in hiding trying to keep them quiet when a search was underway near their, their hiding place. So this was my parents' solution. And who did my uh, parents give me to? My father knew a woman who was a journalist who happened in fact to be a Sudeten German, but he clearly trusted her and he gave me into her care. Uh, she had a daughter uh, who was married, and in fact, married. Uh, the, the daughter had a son literally a few weeks, uh, maybe three weeks or so after I was uh, handed over to the family. Uh, <clears throat> I know little of my time with this family. Only two stories came down to me at the time. Uh, one was, uh, my sister said to me that she remembers my parents and her visiting me once and they felt that I was being well looked after, but the family expressed concern about a German officer who had moved into the building where they lived. Uh, I learned very recently that the building we were in was a very large, uh, 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 a solid uh, three-story building that was divided into three flats. And the woman who my father knew lived in one flat, her daughter, husband, uh, her son and myself lived in another flat and the third was rented or occupied by this German officer. Uh, now, I don't know what happened in this case, whether the German officer ever tweaked to the fact that I was uh, Jewish and simply had enough humanity not to tell on me or never did. But the fact that I'm here to tell a story, clearly he didn't uh, ever uh, denounce me to, uh, to the authorities. Um, because if I was denounced, uh, I would certainly uh, have been uh, killed. But my, the people hiding me would have been in serious trouble with the authorities as well and would have been sent to concentration camp. Uh, the other story that came down to me was uh, on a very hot day in the summer of 44, uh, somewhere I reckon probably I was between seven and 10 months old. We were all in the forest just on the outskirts of Bratislava 
And Peter, their son, and I uh, had no clothes. We were sitting on the ground just playing there. <coughs> when who came walking through the forest, but the wife of the German commandant of the city uh, with her daughter. And as people are, they were attracted to uh, a couple of babies and came over to coo over us. Now the mother would uh, almost certainly have realized that I was a Jewish child. But again, the fact that I'm here uh, suggests uh, that she had more humanity than her husband almost certainly had and didn't denounce me. Now, what I understood was uh, from my parents that because of the Sudeten German uh, background, when the Russian soldiers and their allies were approaching Bratislava, and it was they who liberated Slovakia, uh, the family decided uh, they had to leave and they put me in the care of a local peasant woman. Now, this uh, local peasant woman, it turned out, didn't really want the bother of a child. Uh, I was left uh, for the duration of the time I was with her. I don't know the exact duration time, but I was left uh, in, in uh, a crib most of the time. Uh, I fell ill and suffered from uh, both vomiting and diarrhea. And she discovered that a roll dipped in coffee stayed down. And this became my staple food and in fact, uh, was my food for quite a while uh, after the end of the war. And the roll dipped in coffee uh, remained my breakfast until I became university age, in fact. Uh, now, my aunt, who was in hiding under false papers, was uh, the person who, after the end of the war, collected me. <coughs> and she told me I was 19 months old. She told me that I couldn't walk, uh, I didn't speak a single word, and all I ate, as I say, was a roll dipped in coffee. Nevertheless, the bottom line is that this woman took a risk in hiding me, and for that, if I'd ever known who she was, uh, I would have gladly uh, thanked her. Now, my, my parents and sister, uh, were not liberated until the very end of the war. Theresienstadt was one of the last camps to be li liberated, and it was only at the end of the war. And I don't know how long it took them to be able to make their way to Bratislava, because of course, there were huge numbers of people now trying to make their ways back home from wherever they found themselves. And also transportation was not so good. <coughs> But whenever it was, I was eventually uh, reunited uh, with them. And life returned uh, to some kind of normality. My parents went back to their work as lawyers, but my father remained heavily involved in, in uh, Jewish affairs, a very hot uh, potato at that point in time was the restitution of uh, Jewish property to the survivors, particularly to the, uh, their homes, because other people were now living in them. So this, I know, was uh, one of my father's biggest concerns at, at that point in time. Uh, you may wonder what such a prolonged trauma does to a family. And it's a question I have difficulty in answering. Because as I say, my parents didn't talk about this uh, period, but uh, uh, other than my mother telling me a few stories, they tried to focus always on the future. I think particularly for my benefit, but maybe for their own as well, I don't know. Uh, but uh, when I thought of it as an adult, I thought what a terrible weight uh, my parents must have carried with them. I, I suffered as a teenager with a brief period of what is known as survivor's guilt. Uh, you may, if you've heard of survivor's guilt, it's when there's any kind of uh, event where a lot of people die, but some survive. Now, it can be a natural disaster like a tsunami or plane crash, or in this case, the Holocaust, uh, where the survivors 
ask themselves, why did they survive? They feel guilty about why they survived and the others died. So I had a brief period about my two cousins. Why had I lived and they had, had died? But eventually I, I, I moved on. And in fact, for most of my life, I didn't even see myself as a survivor. I didn't feel I had suffered any trauma. Only my parents and sisters and others were survivors. Uh, but as I say, my, my, I think particularly of my father with all the very close family <coughs> who died. I mean, here was a man who spent so much of his effort trying to help the Jewish community and who was unable to save his own mother and sisters and so on. This must have been a terrible weight, but he never shared it uh, with me. Uh, now, effectively, I've told you the, the, the story of, of what happened to my family and myself. I do want to briefly just recap the reason for my telling these stories, because it's about the future. It's about understanding, first of all, that a genocide doesn't happen from one day to another. It's a process. Uh, it starts with language. It starts by trying to separate the target group from the rest of the society by using words such as uh, diseases or, you know, they, they are a cancer on the body of our society, or there are cockroaches, uh, calling them vermin, things of that nature that try to dehumanize uh, the people. Uh, trying to humiliate them and separate them further in whatever ways uh, they think. Uh, and it's a step-by-step -step process because not even the Nazis in 1933 when they came to power were thinking of mass murder at that stage. That is something that only happened uh, gradually. And even though huge numbers of Jews uh, died before that final decision, it was only at a conference in January 1942, known as the Wanzi Conference, that the, 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 the formal uh, idea that they would exterminate all Jews in Nazi-held territory was uh, discussed. At that meeting, lists of Jews from all Nazi-held territory and, the ter and what they had of territory they thought they were about to get were brought to those meetings and plans laid uh, for the extermination of that, that uh, population. So it's very important to be aware of the beginning of that process. And I've been disturbed, for example, that uh, hearing in recent years, some of that language being used about immigrants, for example. We have to be attuned to that and be very wary. And we, we need to remember that the things we all share in common are much greater than the things that separate us. It's prejudice that tends to magnify the differences. Uh, it's not people who are the issue, it's really ideologies, specific ideas. And when you hear extreme ideologies, you have to fight against them. We have to stop them early on because if it's too late, as it was with the Germany, it's, it's too late. So thank you very much uh, for being patient and listening to me. Uh, I've told you essentially my story, but I'm very happy to answer any questions you have. And please do not feel that uh, you might touch on some sensitivity on any question you ask. I want to assure you I'm happy to answer anything that, that interests you, that, that you're curious about. Uh, I will not take badly in any way, and I'll be happy to answer. So can I turn it over uh, to you for that? Yuri, thank you so very much for sharing <coughs> uh, your family's experience with us. Uh, it is um, humbling and <coughs> extraordinary to say the least. And um, I'm so, so grateful for you doing that. But I absolutely hear you on questions. And I know before, uh, we started, you're very keen to hear questions from people. So may, if I may, I'd like to sort of open it up to uh, the virtual floor, as they say. Um, does anybody have any questions that they would like to ask Yuri now? Um, if so, <clears throat> um, if you can 
raise a hand on on Zoom. I'm not so used to Zoom. I have to say I'm, I'm more used to Teams. But um, if anybody wants to ask a question, if they could try and indicate um, that and um, go ahead, I'd be really grateful. Anybody with a question? Well, perhaps I, I'll, I, perhaps I'd, um, I'll start you off actually, Yuri, and maybe that will um, okay. in encourage people to come and ask you a question. Um, I'm interested that you talked about being brought up in a feminist household, and <laughs> and uh, your story is very much um, one of fortitude, but of women's um, strength, I suppose, and. I, I just wondered what you're thinking about the women in your family <clears throat> who went through that extraordinary experience. And also, I suppose what I wanted to ask was, uh, as a mother myself, the idea of actually handing over your child uh, to somebody else and literally f crossing your fingers because there is little else to do. Um, what, what is it about women in your family, particularly, that you you feel, you know, helped you and the family through through that experience well I, I i don't know how to account for my my mother being as strong-willed as she was because i i know her brother and sister my uncle and aunt as well and they i can't say they were particularly that strong people she was unusually a strong person uh so uh she's definitely was a backbone for me of the family. I didn't think about the difficulty of my being handed on until I was an adult, of course, and could think of it. And when she told me the story, it was just, that's the story. Uh, but as a father myself with three children, I, I realized how extremely difficult it was. All the more because she had me in a very difficult time. I mean, to have a Jewish child in the middle of the Nazi empire was not maybe the smartest thing to do, you could say, but she wanted this child. She wanted me. Uh, and yet she realized that uh, for my own good, uh, the best thing was to hand me over to strangers effectively you know, and hope for the best because what, what could they do? Uh, so uh, I, I admire her for her strength, her great strength. Uh, and uh, and I, I, I should add uh, to telling the story of how my sister was saved uh, when my father was taken. After the war, my father actually tried to identify the officer because he wanted to thank him. Uh, they were sure that it saved her life. She would not have survived the extra months uh, in, in camp. Uh, I, 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 I should say I didn't, uh, I forgot to talk about the general Jewish situation at the end of the war, so I will do so now. But uh, of uh, the Jewish population in Slovakia before the war, only a little over one in five survived to the end of the war, 22%. And the figures for children who went were sent to Theresienstadt are even starker. There isn't one single uh, figure. There's a range in literature, but the most common seems to be roughly 1% of the children uh, survived. So you can understand how uh, lucky my sister, I feel, I felt that my parents and my sister survived when I learned this story. Uh, and my parents are probably right. She wouldn't have survived an extra period of time. That was already uh, difficult. Uh, of course, the Germans were not uh, interested in releasing the officer's name because I'm sure they were convinced it was a revenge killing uh, was being plotted instead. Uh, and I think my father was a bit naive in even trying to find out who he was, but uh, he did. Uh, <coughs> You mentioned that your sister Ruth only told you a snippet of information about what had happened three years ago. And I was struck by that. Um, it, 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 was, was, do you believe that 
the the stories came to her later that she shared or that or uh, no let me talk a um, bit about her what what i think was she she couldn't talk about it and, and i like to think in part that my parents didn't talk about it to protect me because they would have realized that i will grow up without any knowledge till i'm old enough and i start to hear things but maybe they just did it for themselves because the truth is that most survivors did not talk about their experiences. And when you hear from uh, their children, uh, the story is the same. My, my parents didn't talk about it. Uh, it was too difficult. So my, as I say, my sister only told me this one story. Now what happened was that when I started to do these talks uh, for the Holocaust Educational Trust, after a while, I plucked up my courage and I asked my sister, I said, you know, I'm doing these talks and said, if there are any stories that you remember and you're happy to share with me, uh, then I'm happy to hear them. But if it's too difficult, I'll understand. And one of the reasons I felt even able to ask her that was that in her older age, she became quite different person to the young uh, girl I knew when I was growing up who was extremely shy uh, and wouldn't talk about things and so on. She is now quite an outspoken person, much more than I have even, you know, so she wants to change. And when I said that, she said, oh yeah, no, I'm happy to tell you what I, you know, what I remember sort of thing. Uh, so she told me uh, some of the stories I now tell, but she didn't remember an awful lot, you know, daily life, et cetera. She was, really not got a memory of, of it yeah so that's so I, uh, can i ask you then a, a follow-on question from there how did you share the story of your family with your children and and uh, how uh, and for your uh, grandchildren how, i'm fascinated to understand uh yeah. the legacy and the family because the family is so strong um yeah. When you start yeah. to tell your children, how, how on earth would, did that I, I only did a partial job. I, I, my, my children all knew that the family had a, a, a uh, Holocaust history. They had to know that so that when their grandmother or aunt visited, they, they were aware of the background, etc. But I didn't really give them a lot of, like I've, I've given you now, a lot of stories and so on. I didn't really give a, a lot of detail to my children. And when I told them I was going to start to do these talks because the Holocaust Educational Trust asked me to go to schools to do it, my youngest daughter immediately said, oh, I'm gonna come. And I said, wait a minute, it's a school, it's private, you can't, you can't come to it. But what I will do is I will give all of you, I'll tell all of you, the, the, the stories I'm going to tell. So that's when I, I wow. told them. Now for my grand, grandchildren, what I've done is written a letter that not cover, doesn't just cover, in fact, the Holocaust history of the family, but my history when I was young as well, uh, where I lived and all these things so that they should know their family history. When I'm in schools, I usually say as a, an aside at the end to the to the students, ask your families about your family history. I know right now you're focused on the here and now and tomorrow, just as I was at that age. And I'm sorry that by the time I got to a stage where I would have liked to ask a lot of questions, I no longer could ask them, they weren't here anymore. So ask them now, one day you'll be very happy to know those, those stories. And that's why I've written it as well for, for the grandchildren. Um, important point to ask, ask about your family's history I, I can ask you questions all day long and I, and I um I don't want to hog um the questioning is there anybody else who would like to ask a question it's always very difficult over um virtu the virtual see, media yeah. pardon can you see if people want I, I can't know no. if anybody's got they're very welcome to just unmute themselves and ask away if not, I have. Oh, here we are, Jen. Hi. Hi. Please ask a question. Thank you for coming. Thanks, uh, Yuri, for that. It was really good 
listen to something so solid and detailed. Um, so thank you. Um, I wanted to. Ask Sorry, what... I'm just going to try and turn up my volume. Okay. Uh, I'm not a, hearing. Yeah, a anything. bit quiet, I think, Jenna. Try and be louder. Okay, we'll see about <laughs> that. Yeah. Yeah. My question is, what awareness was there during the war of the collective destruction that was going on? Because obviously there was awareness about um, the various devastation that was happening around you and I, there was some news through, but was there still um, a kind of collective shock at the end when it was realized just how much destruction there had been or was that expected given what was going on around you? Uh... I don't honestly know in that, as I say, my parents didn't talk about the subject really. So I don't know what their awareness of the destruction was. I would imagine they had limited information on what was going on outside uh, of their society. That, you know, where, what, what, there weren't a lot of sources of information, but they would have some awareness uh, and, and aware from what they were going through that in any Nazi territory would be going through something similar uh, happening there as well. Uh, I, I don't know, that's, that's probably the best I can, can answer that. Uh, I, I know that uh, my mother was very angry with the rabbis who, uh, these were Orthodox rabbis who told their congregations God will take care, don't, don't worry, God will take care because my mother felt everybody needed to try to think of how to, how to help themselves, how to uh, save themselves. And she was angry about that. Uh, I think that's, that's all I can say. Um, <clears throat> but that awareness that she was talking about, can I ask you um, what, what your feeling is and your view is across looking at Europe as a whole now and and various countries across Europe uh, seeing the rise of the far right. What, what, what's your take on that? Well, it's chilling for, it, it, it's, it's devastating that it can rise again. Mm. Uh, and it's why I do the talks because I think it's only education that can inoculate us against it. Only the awareness of these extreme uh, ideologies uh, and the kind of conspiracy theories that they often have, uh, that these are uh, not based on any facts, you no know, factual basis. Uh, but ignorance allows people to buy into, uh, uh, into all these uh, uh, ideologies. And, and of course, they become, they come into their own, particularly when societies are experiencing difficulties. If a society is going through a, a good economic period and things are peaceful and most people are, are, are fairly satisfied, then you don't get a lot of this extremism. Uh, and I understand uh, some people getting very angry, feeling that they're forgotten by society, that they're marginalized, that they're, they're getting nothing and they're watching people who they think, why are they getting something and I'm not getting anything. I, I understand that but they have to be aware not to buy into then these, these ideologies. So, yeah. And language is so important, isn't it? As you said earlier. Sorry, the, the la uh, language is so important, isn't it? It is. And, and as I say, the language people used oh. here, particularly, it's, it almost felt like when the Brexit uh, mm. uh, uh, vote happened, that people with the extreme views felt free now to voice things that before they were, they, they had felt inhibited. And they now openly started to uh, attack uh, immigrants on, on the underground or whatever, and all these kind of stories, which is extremely sad. And, and we have to... We the have Polish to Centre, just on King Street, <clears throat> um, just after Brexit was dogged with... Uh, hate language I think is the only way and it, it was such a shock terrible not only the shock of Brexit because I am a passionate European yeah. but the shock that I actually <laughs> excuse me in some way unleashed um, 
people to be able to think that they can speak in those terms. Our, our own mayor at the time was um, racially abused and told to go home. This was two days after Brexit. I think we, we've seen, particularly with the American election recently as well, how fragile our democracy can be. Uh, and I think that most people have a feeling that the system we have, et cetera, it's, 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 it's very robust and strong and so on. But we can see how, how easily it can be damaged because people's trust can, can be shifted by a lot of lies and people stop knowing what to believe. That's, it, it's, it's not even important that you buy the lie so much as you stop knowing who to believe and you're totally at the mercy then of, of an authority to say, this is what you need to believe. And you're now so confused. You're Gaslighting upset. culture, yeah. We have, to, we have to be aware of that danger. I'm going to ask the, um, the audience, for want of a better phrase, um, uh, I, again, if you have any more questions, thank you, Jen, for your question. If there's any more questions that anybody would like to raise, just come off camera and pop your hands up so I can see, or just ask away. People are shy today. It's yeah, so we've got, we've got Jasmine uh, with her hand up. Oh, brilliant. I can't see. I'm terribly sorry. So I'm, I'm not ignoring. Jasmine, please go ahead. You have to unmute. Oh, could be. We can't hear you, Jasmine. So. Can we hear from Jasmine? Jas are you there, Jasmine? Looks like Jasmine's unmuted, but nothing's coming through. Oh, okay. Annie's got her hand up. Perhaps Annie wants to go, and then once yeah, she's yeah, done. Annie, yeah, I can't see hands for some reason. Apologies. Oh, yes, please. Struggling with sound. Annie, would you like to ask your question while we're waiting for Jasmine? I think we may have put it in the chat. Actually, that's not a bad idea. If anybody's got any questions, I can see the chat and we can, I can just read them out. So if you can't, for some reason, be able to, to speak to us, you could always put one in, in there. Hello, Yuri and, and Councillor Fenimore. I'm not sure whether you can hear me. It's Mark Finn. Y yes, I can. You can. Hello, Yuri. Hi. Um, I'm getting quite emotional about this. Um, last year, I was very fortunate to visit the Auschwitz, the Auschwitz exhibition in Madrid. And I don't know whether you've had a chance to, um, to visit the exhibition or whether you perhaps some of your stories contributed to it, but it was an emotive journey um, for me. And hearing you now as well, um, brings together the museum with your story. Um, I'm just wondering what, how do we persist? Uh, and we've seen this and you touch upon it, the America with Trump and the democracy. How do we persist in keeping this emotive, this charged in the public's eye as we increasingly appear to become more insular in our, in our, in our approach? And I'm sorry for the emotion there. Uh, I, I, you, you know that the government is proposing to build a Holocaust memorial uh, building in central London and together with a research uh, center. So that is one way to try and obviously schools would be able to visit and so on. That, that would be one way. And it's also very important that the subject is not just the Holocaust per se, but all genocides and all terrible events. Uh, I have to say, when I was growing up, we, we believed that the world had been so shocked by what they learned uh, from what happened uh, that it would never happen again. And then came the nasty shocks of, of seeing genocides in places like Cambodia and Rwanda uh, and, and other places. And there are other events which may not qualify quite as a genocide, but which are equally horrific. 
and, and in which a lot of innocent people suffer enormously. Uh, so sadly, the world, uh, we, we, each generation has to somehow learn anew the dangers uh, of uh, extremism. And uh, I'm not sure there is a simple answer to your question, but education, trying to educate in whatever way is possible. And therefore, Holocaust Memorial Days is an opportunity, for example, to doing it. Uh, uh, I, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you. Great question, Mark. <clears throat> anybody else? Does anybody have any questions that they would like to, to ask? I don't know. Who is I? Hi, I don't, can anybody hear me? Just about. Very faint. Oh, oh, oh that's better. I, that's better. Ah, sorry, I've had to um, hold my uh, microphone bit on the headphones quite close um what i found to get uh, audio by the way um on the top of your i don't know how anybody else has it but i'm having to uh, join through edge at the top there's a little padlock and one of the options you've if you click on that uh you've got an option for whether or not to allow the microphone access to the website that's i think that's probably why i've done to access it for Thank anybody you. else who's trying yeah. um I, my question had been although i, I think you've um although i forget it it's the one that you were just asked. So it, I've missed part of it from the page refreshing about in addition to um, raising your own and others education on the early stages of extremism um, and challenging beliefs when you come across them, what pragmatic action can be undertaken um, here and now, given that we see, I, I know it's probably quite a, a controversial thing to say, but we do unfortunately seem to be at the early stages of um, similar to what was at what you were describing uh, to, you know, uh, back in the 1930s. So uh, what, what pragmatic action can be done now to try and prevent that um, learning from uh, both the previous, both, you know, from your family's experience and also any any changes that might take place in the modern world. But I think you were answering that. Uh, so my apologies for the duplication. Right. right. Uh, I, I really don't know beyond the the education and things like Holocaust Memorial events or uh, setting up a center like the government is proposing to do. Uh, what's the way except whenever we come across some extreme views, we need to be aware that they need to be countered. Uh, very often the view has simply been, oh, it's harmless, it'll go away. Uh, it needs to be tackled earlier rather than later, uh, I think. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you. Um, anybody else, any, any questions as we come towards the end of what's been an extraordinary and humbling experience? Is there any more? Well, I think relying probably on the IT issue, but I think Yuri, um, we can say a huge thank you to you. And and if I may, just before um, we leave, um, on Wednesday tomorrow, which is International Holocaust Memorial Day, um, we're encouraging all our residents, if possible, at eight o'clock to light a candle and put it in the window um, in, in respect and marking of those people who have passed um, and been the victims of genocide. So I'm really encouraging all, all residents to do that. I certainly shall be. But Yuri, I, I can't thank you enough for sharing your story. I, I've so many uh, times you hear stories of such great horror, actually. And, and for you to to share them with us today has been a hugely humbling experience and I can't thank you enough. And um, I hope that maybe we may meet sometime when we're all allowed out again for a coffee and a chat and a thank you. Um, but on behalf of everybody who's uh, tuned in and well, on behalf of Hammersmith and Fulham Council, I can't thank you enough and, and I'm hugely grateful to you for, for sharing what is a, an extraordinary story. You for inviting thank me you. to say again and thank oh. you everyone who's who's tuned in to, to no, this. It's been, thank you very much. 
it's been wonderful. Oh, Thank perfect. you very, very much. We'll make it available on our website as well, so other people who perhaps weren't able to join can can hear it and uh, and hear the old experiences. But again, my my humble and huge thanks to you. Thank, thank you. And I look forward to having a coffee sometime okay. in the future. I'm for that. <laughs>